Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll get started uh, right away. I apologize uh, for the uh, slight delay in our program uh, this morning, but uh, Foreign Minister Vestavella was in the midst of some very important, as I think we can all appreciate, meetings at the Treasury Department. He assures me that everything is all resolved, as he's about to tell us um, in his uh, presentation this morning, so the markets can rest easy now. Um, I'm Fiona Hill, uh, the Director of the Centre for the United States and Europe here at the Brookings Institution. And uh, first of all, I'd just like to uh, welcome everyone here and uh, Foreign Minister Vestavella. On behalf of the institution, our President Strobe Talbot, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, and also the head of the uh, Foreign Policy Programme, Martin Indyk, who also unfortunately is not here. Uh, but you were here, uh, a very large audience. We also have an overflow room. And uh, we would also like to say hello to all the audience of C-SPAN, who are covering this and all of the other uh, media outlets that we have here today. This is obviously a very important speech uh, that we're here present for. And we would like to thank Foreign Minister Vestavella for making the time to come to talk to us in between so many important meetings. He's leaving at 12 o'clock uh, to go and meet with Secretary Clinton. So we would like, of course, not to delay that uh, meeting uh, in any way whatsoever. So I'm going to hand over right away to uh, Foreign Minister Vestavella for his presentation. And he's graciously offered to take a number of questions from the audience. And we'll try to accommodate as many of you as we can. So thank you very much, Foreign Minister Vestavella. Thank you for joining us. Dear Fiona Hill, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I'm delighted and honored uh, to be guest uh, of the Brookings Institution today. And I'm especially pleased to see so many friends of uh, Europe in the audience here. I really want to apologize that uh, I'm a bit uh, late. I'm sorry for this delay, but it is the truth. I just had a meeting with uh, Timothy Geithner and uh, it was very in in intensive, it was constructive. And if this helps to relax the markets, uh, well, it's fine. <laughs> um, the famous line in Mark Twain's memories about Wagner is also true for Europe. The music is better than it sounds. <laughs> and I say this as a great fan of both, of Richard Wagner and of the European integration. I know that there are many questions and concerns about uh, Europe these days. I followed a bit the internal discussions about Europe in this uh, um, important and crucial time in the United States of America. Questions about the current crisis and what it means for Europeans, Americans and other around the globe. Questions also about Germany's approach to the crisis, about the place it sees for itself in Europe. I have come here to answer four fundamental questions as openly and directly as possible. What is the nature of the crisis we are facing? What are we trying to achieve? What is Germany's role in all of this? And of course, what's in it for the United States? First, the nature of the crisis. The term Euro crisis is from my point of view convenient but misleading. It, in its first 10 years, the common currency has been remarkably successful by any standard. Its exchange rate and inflation rate are as stable as that of the Deutsche Mark. The Euro has assumed the role of a second global reserve currency in times of globalization, the euro was the right thing to do. If we, did not, if we did not have it, we would have to invent it now as a lesson learned from the financial crisis that would have had worse effects without a common currency. But it's also obvious that a number of European countries are no longer enjoying sufficient trust in the financial markets. The reasons are slightly different in each case, but three things are at the root of this crisis. To begin with, the word financial crisis as the trigger. Secondly, excessive public and private debt and growing macroeconomic imbalances as a result of lacking competitiveness and flaws in Eurozone governments. 
all of these factors are interlinked in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008, the state had to rescue an over-leveraged and ill-invested banking sector. At the same time, it had to provide a huge fiscal stimulus for the economy. The German fiscal stimulus, by the way, was comparable in relative size to US efforts at the time. As a result, financial markets started questioning the ability of some Eurozone members to repair their debt or to grow their way out of the debt burden, first in Greece, then in Ireland, then in Portugal. The debt crisis morphed into a crisis of confidence, questioning the political will and determination of Eurozone members to fix the flaws in the construction of the monetary union. Second, what we are trying to achieve. There are those who argue that an early and massive rescue operation would somehow have prevented the crisis from developing, as if some sort of unlimited guarantee of Greek sovereign debt by all, over, by all other Eurozone members in the spring of 2010 could have put everything on hold. I frankly don't think that this argument holds up. It focuses exclusively on the contagion issue, but completely ignores the deeper origins of the crisis. The same is true in my view for the argument that Germany, Europe's anchor of stability, somehow misreads the nature of the crisis, that we are trying to amend the rule book instead of putting out the fire. From the very beginning, we have focused on a double track strategy, linking solidarity with partners under pressure, with a firm commitment to fix the Eurozone and put all members on a path of fiscal responsibility. Both is necessary and both is interlinked. So our philosophy in this present crisis is that we on the one hand have to erect the firewall, that we have on the one hand to fight against this present crisis, but that we on the other hand also have to be aware long-term engagement is necessary, long-term solutions are necessary, structural reforms are necessary, otherwise this kind of crisis would hit us every few months, every few years again, and we wouldn't solve the problem. We wouldn't uh, only heal the symptoms, but we wouldn't care about the root and the causes for the crisis we are in. So from our point of view, both is necessary. And if we explain this as a politician, as a German politician, it's crystal clear for us, we have to show and we show solidarity but on the other hand, we have to use the opportunity, the chances in this crisis that we solve the structural crisis, that we give answers to the deficits and to the flaws of the construction in the construction of the Eurozone. Let me emphasize this point again because it represents the core of our approach. There are those who argue that we underestimate the severity of the crisis, that we mistakenly focus on long-term remedies for what is in reality a short-term problem. My answer is, it is actually this argument itself that underestimates the nature and the scope of the crisis. Yes, we need short-term crisis management, but we should not opt for measures that would lay the ground for an even bigger crisis in years to come. And most importantly, our short-term measures will only be credible and effective if we address the root causes at the same time. Some think in the public opinion, some discuss it in the sense that a long-term solution is uh, something we should answer 
in a few months after the present crisis is solved. If our, if our idea, if our analysis is right, and we think it is right, that we are in a present crisis which started as a debt crisis, which morphed into a crisis of confidence, then also a long-term answer is necessary to solve this crisis of confidence. The long-term answer, the sustainable answer, is also important for the international markets, for all the citizens worldwide who want to see that European knows what it has with the European Union and with our common currency. So the combination of both is necessary. It is a comprehensive approach which we um, discuss and which we uh, have as a guideline in our policy. Solidarity with countries having liquidity problems is an indispensable part of our effort. We are now in the final stage of setting up a permanent European stability mechanism to deal with liquidity problems. Germany's share of these financial guarantees is more than a quarter of the total. The German Parliament has approved financial guarantees for more than 200 billion euro. Translated into the size of the US economy, this would be the equivalent of far more than one trillion US dollars in guarantees by the US Treasury. I think this is a remarkable answer. More than 200 billion euros on the table, expressing and showing solidarity, knowing that this is our responsibility in the interest of Europe, but also, of course, in our well-defined national interest as a national economy in the Federal Republic of Germany. But please, one trillion, if I compare it to your size, to the American size of the economy, one trillion dollar. Would this mean if I translate it to you and to your country? And just um, answer the question to yourself. Can you imagine members of Congress approving such a sum to help out non-Americans? The theory that Germany is not demonstrating solidarity with its fellow Eurozone partners in trouble is an urban legion and simply not accurate. The European Central Bank also has a very important role in managing the crisis. It will do what it considers necessary and appropriate with its mandate. It is not for me to comment or to give advice because you know that the European Central Bank is independent and it was one of the German goals in the negotiations 15 years ago that the European Central Bank is independent and not has to follow political orders. First, the core of the, uh, I'm sorry, the core of the problem, however, goes even deeper than providing liquidity. The crisis of confidence requires decisive action on two fronts. First, we have to fix the flaws in the Eurozone's construction when setting it up shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we were not able to go all the way and create a political union side by side with the economic and monetary union. It took a while for the consequences of this failure to become apparent because we enjoyed a decade of low interest rates and strong economic growth, especially, especially in southern Eurozone members. This made it so tempting and easy to neglect the dangerous productivity and competitiveness gap with the Eurozone. We thought we were doing well even without stronger coordination of fiscal and economic policies. This was a mistake. We also allowed the hallmark of our monetary union, the stability and growth pact, to be hollowed out and violated numerous times without real consequences. This was another mistake. And we, we, did not to, we did not reduce public and private debt in good times. This was our third mistake. 
we are now addressing and correcting all three of them. This is why we have pushed for change through the European treaties. This is why we hope to conclude a new fiscal compact by the end of this month. With, the, with this compact, we will firmly establish the principles of future fiscal <laughs> responsibility. We will introduce strong debt break. We call this debt break, if I translate it into uh, American language, into English. Provisions, we, we introduce strong debt break provisions in member states' legal frameworks. And we will significantly strengthen policy coordination within the Eurozone and its prospective members. I'm confident that most non-Euro members of the EU will join in this effort. Our door will also remain open to Great Britain. Yet in my view, tighter rules and better coordination cannot be the end of the story. We have to recognize that we need nothing less than a paradigm change for our countries and our society. The debt economy itself has reached its limits. Fiscal responsibility and sustainability are not a cane concepts for experts, nor are they awkward hobbies of Germans still traumatized by memories of hyperinflation three generations ago. They are the imperative of our time. The policies of debt combined with the shortcomings of the Eurozone construction and compounded by the effects of the financial crisis have led us into the danger zone. We have taken it too far, beyond the point of credibility. And allow me the question, as a guest, with all modesty and politeness, can we really be sure that this is only a problem of the Eurozone? It is the triple origin of the crisis that defies all the easy answers, all the big bazooka remedies put uh, forward by economists and pundits on both sides of the Atlantic and on the island in between. That is why we are focusing our efforts on creating a union of stability in Europe and moving towards fiscal sustainability and growth here and now. We cannot postpone this fundamental change of direction to a distant future. Rescue packages and short-term liquidity are not a solution of, to the crisis. They are buying us time in which to address the root causes, no less, but also no more. The key is therefore to strike the right balance between easing the short-term pain and lying, laying the foundations for a long-term gain. Europe has decided to no longer ease the symptoms of the crisis by fighting debt with more debt. This is an enormous challenge. It will be neither easy nor quick, neither easy nor quick, but it is the only viable path for a stronger Europe in the future. Our partners in Greece, in Ireland and in Portugal and many other countries deserve our respect and our support for the efforts and sacrifice they have made. When we discuss the merits of this argument, let us not overlook the different demographic realities of our societies. In Germany and many parts of Europe, every euro of debt will have to be shouldered by fewer and fewer taxpayers in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, by no means do I advocate austerity only. Apart from the debt issue, the widening gap in competitiveness between Eurozone members is the most important cause of the crisis. Budget cuts alone will not do the trick. Structural reforms are essential for the creation of new growth. 
They are also essential for the long-term cohesion of the Eurozone. It is simply not acceptable that one out of five, that one out of five Europeans under the age of 25 is without a job. In some countries, we are even talking about one out of three. Here we can and we must do better. Reforming labor markets is only one element, but a very important one. We know what, from our own experience 10 years ago when Germany was singled out as the sick man of Europe, that these reforms are politically difficult, but very beneficial for long-term growth and employment. With other words, Germany is asking and urging for structural reforms, but we do not ask any other country in Europe or in the Eurozone for more than we did by ourselves in our own country. Structural reforms are decisive because a currency is only as strong as uh, the economies of the countries behind the currency are successful. This is the very change, uh, this is the very challenge that some of our partners in Europe are now facing. Others, like for example the Baltic states, have already successfully implemented these reforms and have returned to solid growth. And we will do more. We will employ unused EU structural funds to stimulate economic growth. We will focus the upcoming EU budget for the years 2014 to 2020 on an innovation and new technologies and move away from subsidizing the economy of yesterday. A budget, by the way, to which Germany will be the biggest net contributor. And finally, we should never lose sight of the benefits of free trade. We work hard to expand free access to the emerging markets. Shouldn't we also put the issue of a transatlantic free trade area high on our agenda, a free trade area that is not weakening our WTO efforts for global free trade. We are, after all, more deeply integrated through trade and investment ties than any other two economic areas of the world. This brings me, ladies and gentlemen, to my, to my third question. What is Germany's role in all this. When you look at most of the public commentary, you can't help but feel a dilemma. We are either criticized for being too cautious in addressing the crisis or for being too dominant in dictating our own policies to others. We take both views seriously and we believe both are beside the point. To be, to be perfectly clear from the outset, there is no good future for Germany without a good future for United Europe. While there, is an, that while there are undoubtedly differences in opinions among German political parties on the details of crisis management, there is a broad consensus that the answer to the current crisis has to be more Europe, not less Europe, Germany is and remains deeply and firmly committed to a united Europe. The integrated single European market is the basis of our wealth and economic prosperity. The integrated decision making in Brussels, while often tedious and full of compromises, has been the basis of more than six decades of peace among the European Union member states. The integrated trade and foreign policies are our best chance to preserve our European way of life and to assert our values and interests in a globalized world with new centers of power. Going it alone is not an option for Germany. 
however strong our economy may be. History has taught us, with chapters too dark to forget, that European integration was and remains the only convincing and viable answer to the so-called German question. This fundamental insight continues to guide our policies. I'm personally deeply committed to the idea of a European Germany. And, and allow me, beside this um, text and my prepared speech, to make a very personal remark to you here in Washington. I was born in 61, so I'm the first generation with parents who grew up in time of Second World War. And for us, for my generation, Europe and the European Union was always more than just a single market or a common currency or monetary system. I remember the talks with my parents, difficult enough, about the Nazi time and the war. I remember in the 60s and when I was a bit older in the 70s when I went to school, how it was to travel to other European countries, to our neighbor countries. I remember when I was in the age probably of 14 or 15, or even a bit younger, when I traveled to France, to the Atlantic coast in the Bretagne, by tent. I remember in the middle of the 70s that I was there with three friends traveling around the Bretagne with tents and railway. And I wanted to buy something in real rural area in a single room shop. And there was a lady, the owner of this single room shop. She was, from our point of view in those times, very old. She was in my age now. <laughs> and um, we were, I think, three boys in this single room shop. She wear her traditional clothes. Some of you have been there. You know what I mean. In those days, there were no touristic reasons to wear this. And I was very slim, fair hair blue eyes, horrible accent when I tried to speak French. Was really a torture for everyone. Je voudrais l'addition, s'il vous plaît. Une tante pour trois personnes. It's something like that. But it was a very serious, impressive moment for the rest of my life. We were in this room it was easy to see that I was German in the middle of the 70s. And this lady, who was the owner of the shop, didn't serve us. She went out of the shop to this room, a little kitchen behind this single room shop. And we could hear that she started to cry. She, wasn't, she didn't want to serve us. And then the daughter came out of this kitchen. And she talked to us, three young men, 14, 15 years old. And she said, I apologize, boys. This has nothing to do with you personally, but my father, her husband was killed in Second World War by the Germans. And if you grew up in this situation, 
I think you would understand by the deepest of your heart that Euro and Europe is always more than a single market and a common currency. It is the answer to the darkest chapter in our history and it's also our life insurance in times of globalization. And please forgive me that I want to underline my personal commitment and the commitment of my generation, the European commitment of the Germans with this very personal remarks. But probably you understand that for us this is not a technical question, it's a historical question for us. And this will, will may prove you and show you that the German commitment about Europe and the Eurozone is out of discussion. However, it would be wrong to deny that there are different visions of what Europe should be. There are those who do not want an open, tolerant and integrated Europe. There are those who stress the differences by their ethnics of religious rather than what unites us. They are advocating a fortress Europe. This is a vision that we need to oppose forcefully. The renationalization in a time of globalization is a dangerous concept and this is a message to whom it may concern. The financial, political and human cost of a dis disintegrating Europe would be crippling and it would be foolish to believe that Europe could withdraw into some sheltered corner. Yet it is only if we can put our own house in order that we can seriously and credibly establish Europe as a strong political actor on the global stage. I'm deeply convinced that Europe has something to offer beyond preserving its wealth and its own security. We are a community of values. We are founded upon the fundamental rights of the individual. Our European model of shared sovereignty can be an inspiration in a globalized world in need of order. This leads me to my fourth and my final point. What's in it for the United States? I firmly believe in what Vice President Joe Biden said so eloquently in his speech to the Munich Security Conference three years ago. I was there and I could listen to him. In sharing ideals and searching for partners in a more complex world, he said, Americans and Europeans still look to one another before they look to anyone else. This is, to add my own words, this is what we have done in the past. This is what we are doing today. This is what we have to do in the future. The effects of globalization confront us with new challenges from climate change to water and food shortages, from cybersecurity to the protection of the global commons. New powers are rising faster than we could foresee only a few years ago. Their growing economic weight increasingly translates into political weight. Every government on our two continents is shifting resources towards fast-growing new centers of power in Asia and elsewhere. And yet, when we confronted the pressing issues of today, it is above all Americans and Europeans who share the same values, interests, objectives, and resources. We continue to fight alongside each other in Afghanistan. At the Bonn Conference in December, we pushed forward our joint strategy for a gradual transfer of responsibility to the Afghan authorities. We are working on a political solution to prevent the country from ever again becoming a safer haven, a safe haven for terrorism. We stand firmly together in confronting Iran's 
increasingly dangerous course. And for us, like for many of you, the security of Israel is raison d'etre. The European Union will put into place a new and very substantial round of sanctions this coming Monday to forcefully make the point that Iran's behavior in the nuclear issue is unacceptable and a danger to world peace. We are looking, we are working closely together and with our partners in the Arab League to address the ongoing bloodshed in Syria where a brutal regime resorts to violence and uh, violence against its own people. We are joining forces to support the transformation underway in the Arab world towards more representative, more participatory political systems. Both America and the European Union put a particular emphasis on the empowerment of women as a key to successful transformation. We work closely together to facilitate a negotiated and lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians. We will reaffirm our close alliance at the NATO summit in Chicago in May, an alliance and of collective defense, an alliance that gives itself the means to be an element of stability in an increasingly fragile world. Possibly the most important common task of all will be to restore the legitimacy and viability of our economic model. The proper regulation of the global financial system is still unfinished business. We have to continue to work on it together and in the G20 framework. This includes making sure that the IMF has what it takes to play its crucial role in the global system. If we do not address these issues in a convincing fashion, we will face a systemic crisis of legitimacy that by far transcend our two economies. It would undermine our own political systems and it would sharply diminish our ability to successfully promote our values and interests globally. Ladies and, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, when I look at the American debate over the past weeks, I see mostly a caricature of Europe. The image of a continent mired in gloom and self-absorption. I beg to differ. First point we actually overcame socialism in Europe 20 years ago. And we owe this, among others, to the firm commitment to the idea of freedom by both democratic and republican American administrations. Secondly, the World Economic Forum's most recent global competitiveness index lists seven European countries in its top 10 list. Three of them are members of the Eurozone. European companies are among the fastest growing businesses in America, investing billions of dollars and creating thousands of jobs in this wonderful country. Finally, Europe is the largest donor of development, assistance, and humanitarian aid across the globe. In short, Europe is a strong and a vibrant continent, and I firmly believe that we will emerge stronger from this crisis. My vision of our future strategic partnership sees the United States and the United Europe at the core of the enlarged West in a world with new centers of power agreement between the US and the EU will no longer be sufficient to shape global solutions. But we can, and we should be a motor of progress. We have to engage with new powers and bring on board new partners in order to build a broader consensus. In a world where the idea of freedom continues to gain strength it is imperative 
that the West, the cradle of freedom, stands together. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Foreign Minister Vestival. I think, as you can see from the uh, round of applause uh, that you received, this was a very powerful and well-received uh, speech. And I think many of the people in the audience, uh, when you were relating your personal story from uh, Brittany and your tour in France, um, I was looking at the audience and everyone had fallen very silent and very thoughtful. I think that really made um, a big impact on the way that people think about the exercise that you and uh, our other colleagues in Europe are engaged in uh, right now. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, I will also uh, look to some of your colleagues uh, from uh, the Foreign Minister and Embassy to signal uh, to me with um, a meaningful gesture when you need to leave because we certainly don't want to hold you up from the important issues you have to discuss today. But I know that there are a lot of questions. Uh, some people have already tried to attract my attention. So what I will do, uh, if it's okay with you, I will try to group uh, maybe two or three questions uh, together. I'll keep a note of them in case uh, we lose track. And we'll try to fit in as many questions um, as possible. Obviously, you've covered a lot of territory in your speech. The primary points were about the Eurozone and what Germany and other European countries are doing uh, to tackle all of the issues you laid out. But you also touched at the end upon some of the issues that you're here to discuss, the upcoming summit uh, in, in May in Chicago for NATO. Uh, there may be some questions about that. You talked about your discussions uh, with the uh, United States counterparts on issues related to the Arab Spring, to Syria, to Iran, uh, the Arab-Israeli uh, peace process. Uh, the, so there are many issues that perhaps people here in the audience may want to cover. But I'll start with uh, Michael Holtzel, um, one of our colleagues from across the road at SAIS, uh, who also used to work with uh, someone you uh, quoted today, uh, Joe Biden, uh, before he became uh, the vice president. And as you will probably recognize from uh, Mr. Holtzel's name, he has some German connections. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, uh, for a really stimulating and heartfelt speech. I, I would take issue with only one thing you said, Let me, and that was the rhetorical question at the beginning of your speech when you asked whether the United States would commit the equivalent of a trillion dollars to essentially help non-Americans out of their economic problems. With all due respect, I think that's what you would call in your country falscher Fragestellung. I mean, that's the wrong question to ask. The question is whether, I would submit, uh, Americans from wealthier, more competitive parts of the United States, through their elected political representatives, would agree to appropriate money to help the country as a whole, especially their, citi their fellow citizens elsewhere. And I think this is probably what the European Union is striving toward. And in that regard, I'd like to pose the question about Eurobonds. It's something you didn't bring up. It's often talked about. As I understand it, the uh, federal government has basically said that it won't consider this essentially until after the elections next year. I wonder how you feel about Eurobonds as, as, as a means of, of showing the solidarity that you've expressed uh, both in terms of short-term and long-term. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Clara O'Donnell? And if people could introduce themselves for the minister as well before they ask a question. Thank you. Um, Clara O'Donnell, visiting fellow at the Centre on the Western Europe here at Brookings. You mentioned the UK. Um, I was wondering if you could give further details of your assessment of the UK's response to the Eurozone crisis so far. And then a, a gentleman um, right at the uh, very back here, please. Ian Talley, Dow Jones, Wall Street Journal. I'm wondering, uh, the negotiators are in Greece right now, uh, hoping to close a deal. I'm wondering whether you have hopes for a deal to be done uh, before Monday. And secondly, um, uh, you made very clear in your speech uh, Germany's commitment to United Europe. Uh, is there, um, can you characterize how far that commitment extends? Um, is there a point at which, politically or economically, that uh, Germany will not commit to a united Europe? Uh, Foreign Minister, uh, so we have a question about Eurobonds as a means of solidarity, the UK response, and then a very pertinent question about how far uh, Germany uh, will uh, commit itself uh, to uh, 
the enterprise at hand and, of course, about the, uh, the deal that uh, we're expecting before Monday. Chris? Michael Hoso, I would like to, um, to answer to your answer, if you allow, because you used this wonderful German phrase, falsche Fragestellung. Uh, falsche Fragestellung in, in Germany is a very well-used term by politicians <laughs> if they don't want to answer the richtige Frage. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said nothing else, that there is a cliché and there is a stereotype in the public discussions. Germany is not committed clear enough. They do not show enough solidarity. Europe and the Eurozone is not active enough, are not quick enough in their decisions. The opinion leaders, the governments are too weak. They discuss more than they act. And I think this is completely wrong. Because, I mean, um, you know what kind of discussions you had on the Hill about debts. <laughs> not my business. But then you can imagine how complicated it is to discuss and to decide such a size of solidarity in a totally different situation, political different situation. You are one country, not since 10 years. And you have experienced structures, public services, parliaments, decisions, opinion leaders, White House, and so on and so on. When we are talking about Europe, please be aware, we have national countries in Europe. We are national countries, and we are together in a union. We are not one country yet. From my point of view, and I think you could read this between the lines of what I said, from my point of view, it is necessary to develop with the next chapter of integration, Europe more and more into this direction. But at the moment, we are not. At the moment, we are 27, probably after Sunday, uh, and the referendum in Croatia, 28. This year, next year, 28 member states. 27 national countries united under one political umbrella, with one parliament with limited authorities and possibilities. There is no one government. We do not have a president in the sense of you use the word president in America, in the United States. And this was the only thing why I wanted to compare it. So if there is a discussion, uh, in, in, in a public discussion, Germany does not do enough does not show enough solidarity. I just wanted to compare it with the size of our economies. I mean, we are 80 million citizens on the European continent. We are not the so-called superpower worldwide. Uh, we are, from our point of view, a very successful country, and we showed that we know uh, what we have to do in the last 10 years excellent growth rates, decreasing unemployment rate, a economic situation, a social situation, better than we had the most time uh, in, in, in uh, our history. So I just, wanted to, I just wanted to tell you 200 billions for Germany, more than 200 billions in Germany, euros we put on the table for solidarity with no doubt decided, with 80% support in the German Bundestag, all over the party lines, is really a lot. And I just wanted to ask that we do not underestimate this money and this, this uh, solidarity. This was the only fact, not to criticize my friends here in the United States. And uh, I mean, if you know me a bit longer, you know that I'm uh, working for the Transatlantic uh, Partnership and Friendship uh, many years before I uh, became member of the German government. So if we are talking about 
more than 200 billion euro in Germany, it is in your ears, if you translate it into your situation, it is a thousand, more than a thousand billion dollars in, um, in the United States of America. This is the only thing I wanted to, I just wanted to explain, not to criticize anyone. Just wanted to translate it, because sometimes I have the impression uh, the expectation management about Germany is also necessary. Sometimes I think uh, uh, you look to Germany and think uh, we can shoulder everything. There is a responsibility to protect, but we always have to see the capability to protect and to help. Both is to balance. This was the only background of my uh, little <coughs> ironic remark. And um, also, if you please uh, just imagine how complicated sometimes it is to decide. The European uh, institutions, with one exception, all other governments, all other parliaments, 26 parliaments, independent national parliaments, decided to support this agreement, decided to show solidarity, and decided to open the next chapter of European integration. And always was European integration the answer to the last crisis. This is normal. Eurobonds, what you said. My answer is very short and very simple. I do not think that you can solve a debt crisis by making it easier to take up new debts. To fight debts with debts doesn't work in the private life and it does not work in countries, in nations. This is our authority and our, our idea. And please don't forget, once again, everything what we asked for for structural reforms we did before in our own country retirement age, and so on and so on. We did all this in our country. And this is the reason why I wanted to say, and now please put on my glasses. As, um, I mean, not immediately. <laughs> uh, but put on my glasses. <laughs> and look to my glasses to the, uh, to the situation. Do you think that, uh, for example, some member countries in the European Union we work courageous on these structural reforms if we as Germans would say, you get the money, thank you, we are fine. So it's a mutual agreement. We show solidarity, but we ask those who ask for solidarity to do their homework, to fulfill and to work on the necessity of structural reforms. And competitiveness, we all know this, is the key question uh, in this uh, crisis for new growth and then, of course, for balanced budget, which is, of course, our <coughs> long-term goal. About United Kingdom, your uh, second question. Thank you so much for this. Um, I was also a bit ironical uh, because I just have been uh, in the United States after these 9th of December summit we had in Europe and then in the, in the European Union. And please understand, I know, of course, the public opinion in the United States of America is very much um, influenced by the discussion in Great Britain, which is very understandable so, because most American people do not follow our German language, which is obvious, of course. And of course, there's a long tradition and a long and, and a common cultural roots. There's no, no doubt about it. But what I want to say is, as German forester, as German foreign minister, I want to have Great Britain on board. Mm. And we have to work now, how can we build 